Hello, welcome to Quark Talk. I'm Crystal on this Tuesday morning. I've got somebody here who's supposed to be in school, but you know what? It's all good because we're doing a very healthy topic today. We have the the luxury of having a mother-daughter team to talk about the relationship between parents and children, especially when teens have issues at home or at school or wherever. Because honestly, the teen years is just a whole nother ball game, isn't it? I mean, I've got two and it's just like, I don't know what's going on. And I'm sure even if you don't have teenagers, you were once a teen. And my God, are there experiences that you don't want to share. But you know what? We're going to do it today and we're going to focus on the concept of pain because you know there's a lot of self-harming with teens and that's not necessarily just nowadays it could have been you know all along and we're going to ask our therapist today to discuss all those issues but so again pain self-harm self-inflicting harm why do teens do that and how do we as parents are um how can we communicate with them and to find signs so that we don't have these issues or can avoid certain problems. So welcome, and we're gonna talk now. I've got our two lovely mother-daughter guests. It's really <laughs> sweet to have both of you here. Welcome, this is Catherine Middleton. Welcome, say something <laughs> about yourself. Hi, I'm in 11th grade. That's it, and um, you're an honor student. Are you, do you have any special interests? Uh, I really enjoy history and art and English and most of the time math, but sometimes it's frustrating. <laughs> wow, if only my kids would like any of those course subjects, <laughs> I'd be like, phew. <laughs> and of course, our lovely uh, Ingrid Middleton, who's been here before, mm -hmm. and a therapist who focuses on a lot of teen issues. Mm -hmm. uh, welcome again, Ingrid. Thank you. So nice Thank to you have you here. So let's start off with the concept of pain. Um, maybe a parent's interpretation. You wear two hats today, by the way, mm -hmm. yeah? You're mm -hmm. a therapist plus mom. Mm -hmm. um, let's start with you, Catherine. I mean, in school, do you see there's a prevalence of um, self-inflicting, you know? Particularly self-inflicting? Um, anything to do with that that you feel that is, is an issue or a problem? Uh, well, in my school, I defi I'm not sure if this is specifically because it's an all-girls school or particular right. to an all-girls school. There's not so much that cattiness of dis de self-destruction as far as um, boys go in, in that mm. particular subject, but I definitely do see people who, um, there's kind of a theme that's going on with my generation and that is to withhold all your pain mm -hmm. and to internalize it. I know that I definitely do it. I, I, I experience it in my friend group as well. So I think it's, a lot of it is the internalization of that pain and not expressing mm -hmm. it. And so oftentimes it'll come out in various situations. Right, so it needs to channel somehow, mm -hmm. right? So Ingrid, when you hear that and you know that you know kids are holding things in, how does that make you feel? Oh my goodness, it's probably the most challenging part of being both a therapist and a parent because I will see Catherine going through various things and we, we have this relationship where she knows she can come to me with pretty much anything and we have a very open dialogue and I think we communicate really well, but, but there are times where I really don't know 100% of what's happening and she's not really telling me, but I sense there is something, and gen it usually it has to do a lot with school, and then the pressures of what is she going to do when she gets out of school, and what college is she going to go to, and there's, there's unfortunately, and I think when I was her age, we had time to play. We had time <laughs> yes, to get in trouble sometimes, it's crazy. and it's like, that isn't even the remotest thought in her is mind. Is that much pressure? I guess at that age, mm -hmm. junior, senior years are really mm -hmm. intense. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of pressure as far as grades go, and now, I mean, you can't you can barely get a job at McDonald's if you have only a high school degree, so. Oh, gosh. Okay, well, don't worry about jobs <laughs> yet. <laughs> You've got two good years in school here, a year and a half. But when you say withholding pain, like, what type of pain are you talking about? I think, m for the most part, it's emotional pain, you, uh, especially in a first world country. You don't see a lot of physical pain unless right. it's domestic abuse. Um, however, there... Uh, as a teenager in general, you, there's a surge of hormones, so you're experiencing that emotional growth, but at the same time, you don't have a lot of room to actually grow because, a lot, at least for me, a lot of the time I'm focused on school and learning. Right. And Ingrid, <laughs> she's a therapist <laughs> in her own right. My I know. God. She says, Mom, I don't want to be a therapist, but then she is. But you know? she sees the big picture in this young world. It's amazing. It really is. Yeah, there's a kind of strange thing that goes on, too, with regard to my practice, because um, 
I've been often told, as when I was learning all of my um, theory and so forth, we had teachers that would say, please don't work with kids your own age. Like, don't counsel children that are the same age as your children oh, because there's a lot of transparent stuff that can uh -huh. go on. Right, right. Um, but, but I, and I, so I will see kids that are my daughter's age, sure. but I tend to see that there's just so many similarities. They all kind of are going through this the same types of things where right. they just feel under so much pressure to But perform. the fact that you realize or see, uh, you know, reasons for those pains and, and to see the big picture is really quite mature. Um, and you. so probably you don't have the issues compared to some other, do you have friends who have actually done things that you see like, oh my God, she has so many problems. Because my 13 year old daughter tells me that she knows a couple of kids in her class in eighth grade have cut themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, where does it come from and why is that age so, you know, sensitive to these possibilities? Uh, is that directed to me? Well, both, whatever. Well, I think there's a lot of things. I think uh, on, on a good point and a negative point, but social media, because they, mm. they can find things out, like, relatively simply. They can just type in a YouTube, and then there'll be somebody talking about the ways that they self-harm, and then it's like a virus that'll spread, and then people have ideas about, oh, well, that will maybe work for me. And so it can start off as kind of a cultural fad and then mm -hmm. it can turn into something really personal and dangerous. But I do you mean, think it stems from something where they are crying out for attention or um, you know in response or rebellion to something? Where I think it? it could be all of the above. Mm -hmm. I think it really just depends but I think it boils down to the notion that they don't feel that they're safe or comfortable talking to someone about what is really going on deep down inside. And yeah. Parents, as we talked about last time, they're so busy and they've got so many balls in the air. I mean, just even in Hawaii, it's tough to make a living. So you <laughs> yeah. typically have right. two parent households that yeah, are going 100 so miles an hour. And, and so when I work with parents, I just say, you know, just have a conversation. Just have a conversation with your child. Sit down and be interested in what they're doing and not grilling them or not no. trying to blame them. But, no. but find out what are they thinking? What yeah. are they curious about? What's happening? And you know, their minds yeah. about, you know, just um, everyday things. Yeah. Well, in my experience, you know, because boys don't communicate as well as girls do, so um, my 16-year-old my son is usually it comes out when I'm not asking for it, like whether yeah. it's in the car or we're doing something, we're talking about something <laughs> the else, then something will come out about reference, and then, then you go in and ask a little more. <laughs> but, you know, that's like a luxury. I'll take it, yeah. you know, when it comes. We have our car conversations uh, after school. On the way to school, it's like there's no talking. It's like we just have somber. <laughs> she sleeps Well, that's sometimes. because I just Do fall not, Your brain's not up yet. Okay. <laughs> but what are the differences, you think, in terms of teen um, girls and boys in terms of their concept of pain and expression? Well, I think uh, there's definitely throughout history even as for males, they have been taught that if you have emotions or if you portray your emotions too vividly, then you're not a man, you're a woman. Oh, gosh. Is that socializing? <laughs> what do we blame for that, though? Oh. Is that, that's well, not social media. That's like I think it's just a trend that's uh, come across throughout history. It's and it bo it boils up in different places in modern times, and you see it. And in, I mean, we try to suppress it. We try to have. We try to suppress it through feminist movements, things like that. But right. it's still it's very intrinsic. It's almost um, instinctual to have a man suppress his yes. emotions. Right. right. Well, and you can take it to a whole other level and then you ask women, you know, what are they looking for in a man? And they're, they're mm. going to say, we want someone to protect us. We, you know, right. it's not necessarily somebody who's going to cry when they feel sad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's sort of, I think it goes all the way back to the very beginning of humankind. And, and when we were first, you know, populating the earth and it was, you know, women yeah. were home taking care of the kids and the man was going out to hunt and then bringing home the stuff and they don't have time to to cry and be upset they have work to do right. out there so, so let's think about the caveman ages if we were in that world what is pain to you in that type of scenario so hunters would just grin and bear it right mm -hmm. and what would the women do about pain it's a good question talk maybe yep, they, they have they their community it's the red tent. it's like the absolutely well, yeah right? it's a very anthropologically speaking it's a very common trend for women to come together in their community 
communities while the men go off right. and ha have their little man time. Yeah, so it's therapy <laughs> for women to just chat with each other. It it's is. natural. It but is. men don't do that. They don't. And they do it in sort of, stra not strange ways, but like <laughs> over games or over safe subjects where they feel like they can bond without necessarily getting emotionally close. So, Do you think people actually seek pain because there's some kind of pleasure that um, is associated with it? You know, the whole concept of no pain, no gain. Like you need to push yourself so that you feel that pain in order to grow and challenge and move forward. What do you I feel think about so. That? I think I know with some of my folks that um, a lot of times they seek pain just because that's the way they can feel something. Right. And as you know now, with the proliferation of antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications, yeah. all these things that numb are very basic instinctual emotions. And yeah. So we're not even really, we're not help. I don't know that we're, I mean, they're essential for our society, but but I don't know that they're necessarily helping people um, yeah. work through that stuff. I'm really glad you brought up that because painkillers is a big problem nationwide, worldwide, mm -hmm. right? I mm -hmm. mean, you hear it in the news all the time, but how much does it affect our, our lives and, and our social circle? Do you know any, because I know my, my son has his circle friends and they do, they, they find painkillers as a drug mm -hmm. and they, they abuse it. And then again, does it go back to the numbing and why it's so attractive? Mm -hmm. I, I definitely, I know people who are on the Xanax trend, yeah, right. um, all the, and it, that kind of is a numbing agent because yeah. they also, they look for anti-anxiety medication, they look for anti-ADD medication, yeah. and that's very numbing in a sense because it tones down your energy. And, and it's very accessible, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, do you have any ADHD patients who actually I have, abuse their... Well, I have... It's a complicated question, Ugh. but I have parents that um, that are addicted to various prescription pain medications. Right, okay. They can't get them from physicians anymore, so mm -hmm. so they will actually find them in um, online pharmacies and get them that way. And then the kids get a hold of them, and right. then you've got this proliferation of it going on in the families. Yeah, and then in the schools, because the kids know who has them, the mm -hmm. prescriptions, and they, I don't know if they sell them or they find a way to share it. It's I personally don't know because, I mean, it's not something that I do. Right, I just know circle. that it's an occurrence. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it's it's a scary occurrence because it's out there, and we as parents need to know that this is out there. So I mean, there are so many issues on the table. You know, for on one side, we're we're kind of encouraging pain to feel something, like you said, but at the same time, people are are numbing themselves because they don't want to feel certain types of pain. How do we as parents deal with that? Why don't we take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll really kind of digest. Um, and uh, think about how we look at pain, all right? So don't go away. Aloha Kako. I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to navigate the journey with us. We are here every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. and we really want you to be with us where we look at the options and choices of end of life care. Aloha. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., you'll have a chance to come and listen and learn from scientists around the world. Scientists who talk about their work in meaningful, easy to understand ways. And you'll come to appreciate science as a wonderful way of thinking, way of knowing about the world. You'll learn interesting facts, interesting ideas. You'll be stimulated to think more. Please come join us every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii for Likeable Science with me, your host, Ethan Allen. Back here on Quack Talk with mother-daughter team Ingrid and Catherine Middleton mm -hmm. talking about pain uh, within the teen community and how we as parents can um, communicate these issues with them. Uh, so let's go back. We're talking about this whole contradiction of wanting the pain and numbing it. Um, you know, did you ever read Milan Kundera? There's this philosophical writer, and I remember years ago I wrote one of his books, and the title of the book is The Unbearable Lightness of Being. Mm. Now, obviously, that's more catered to the, the, the weight of a body and, and love and passion and the need for that, but I was just thinking there is a certain need for weight. Like, we as people need to feel like there's trouble almost to give us substance. Do you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I. I'm thinking of it maybe more in terms of that we have all of these senses. We have hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, feeling, and, and that by, by taking pills or, or doing things that numb us, we are not able to really feel those things that are kind of intrinsic in who we are. I use the word cheeky. <laughs> <laughs> See? Yeah. Um, so um, 
so that's not really answering your question. No, but, no, no, but, it's not. Um, but, but I feel like we have all of these capabilities, and, and when one or two of them are not really used, um, it tends to affect us, and then we get up into trouble, yeah. and we just don't, we don't do well. We're not healthy. And especially for girls, because we, we think things so much. Um, I don't want to pry into your private life, but, you know, as, as in your teen years, you know, with relationships and possibilities, I know you go to an all-girls school. I don't know how you meet guys, but they don't. I do. Well, I went to an all-girls school. Really? <laughs> no guys. Are there no, come on, you have to have, like, some socials. Well, I know some groups do. I just, I don't have time. But that's really good <laughs> that she's able to isolate that time well, to focus. It's good and not so good. Yeah. And I think that's maybe one thing that, that's difficult is that we don't have exposure to it. So how is she going to handle it when she goes to college? Oh. It will be like... <laughs> <laughs> She'll figure it out. <laughs> but, you know, for your average student who does go to a co-ed school, um, I'm sure there are so many relationship issues, especially for girls. Mm -hmm. And again, that need for that weighted drama mm -hmm. to give themselves that type of, uh, you know, it's almost a desirable mm -hmm. feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a total... Drama. Like, I love <laughs> drama. I mean, not when it's about me, but whenever right. there's drama going on, it's like everyone in the school is just like, cr cr they're crazy. They're like, give it to me. Right. So there's an energy yeah, and attractiveness definitely. to that. Mm -hmm. So you think that um, youths tend to seek drama because they need that. I mean, again, that translation of pain in an emotional way mm -hmm. is something that we as teenagers tend to seek. I think pain and drama are a little bit different because I think okay. drama brings people in to something that they can have in common with each other. So right. it's almost like a bonding experience. True. Whereas pain is so individual, and I think that that is where people get really lost because yeah. they can't really communicate that necessarily with a group or, or have people come in and support them with what they're going through. So, But so oftentimes drama can lead to a painful uh, experience. And, I mean, I don't know, as, as again, as parents, how do you sense when something's going the wrong way? Whether you're, the kid is going through a relationship and they're closed off, obviously, and mm -hmm. then they have certain signs, there must be, of well, again, the this, wrong track. Well, again, this just goes back, at least I'll speak for a second, and then I'll have Catherine speak, but I think it goes back to just really knowing your child, and or at least spending the time and taking the time to pay attention to what's going on. And, um, and again, parents don't have a lot of time, so it's just the times they do have, it seems like they're arguing, or is your homework mm, done, or right. it's kind of like task-oriented. Yes, yes. And I think some of our happiest times are literally when we're doing nothing, where we're just kind of hanging out, and there's like no agenda, and we can just kind of be with the moment. But I think those moments are really important for parents to have with their kids. Mm. Do you appreciate your time with your mom? Oh, 100%. I, if, I, if my mom's working during the day and I don't <laughs> see her, I only see her in the morning and at night, then I feel extremely depleted. Wow. <laughs> like I'm not getting enough sustenance. Wow. Yeah. But then, I wish every <laughs> kid could say that about their mom. But then again, we, like, we do have a, a special relationship, I would say. I, I, I know not everyone has that kind yes. of relationship with their parents. So. Right. I know last time when Ingrid came on and your mom came on and said that she had such a great relationship with you, I'm thinking, that's bullshit. You know, <laughs> nobody <laughs> has like such a good communication with their parents. Something's wrong. Yeah. Something's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, we've faced a lot of hardships throughout our, you know, history and just challenges, um, just with a lot of different things. And I think that's brought us closer. And I don't know, we just, we're pretty honest with each other. We know when something's up, and, and at the same time, this is what I love about being a parent. It, at the same time, I am, I am the number one um, fan of my daughter moving forward with her life, so it's not like I'm so attached that okay, I'm going to so have to... Okay, so maybe that's a big one. Mm -hmm. When oh parents are gosh, holding yes. on, absolutely. that is where they will need to find the ways absolutely. to escape. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. The, the kids will. Yes. Um, and I have clients right now that that's happening with. The parents are about to send their kids off to college. Mom's panicking yeah. and just like going crazy, saying my daughter's not ready. And it's like, no, she's ready. You're not ready. But what if the other extreme? Because I feel like I'm a free-range mom. I'm really, really relaxed with their things. And my son just criticized me over the week because I said my daughter got sick because she went out for a sleepover twice in a row. And, and, and he, he, he said, you as a mom should have put your foot down and just not let her go out twice in a row. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm trying to let you have your own choices yeah. so that you can figure things out for yourself. Well, and that's how you let her. If she gets sick, you know, then you she better make a choice. She will learn, absolutely. Okay. It's not always roses and Valentine's What do you Day feel chocolate? about that? I mean, in terms of parent, I mean, you must have friends who are very strict parenting. And how do you feel about the ideal parent communication with a, a, you? I do have friends who have helicopterish parents, yes. and I can see that that is not 
an it's effective a way of <laughs> parenting. They're <laughs> stressed out, and it just it really weighs down their happiness mm -hmm. and emotional stability. Uh, though at the same time, it's not good to have a parent who's overly lenient, um, <laughs> right. because then no. the kid can just do whatever they want. <laughs> I mean, right. so. I mean, my mom's a nice middle, so mm -hmm. I, I got really lucky. How reciprocal is the communication? Because obviously you're looking out for her and encouraging her in her life, but how often do you ask your mom how she's feeling about life? Because I think a lot of times it's all one-way street. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not one way. Uh, That's great. Well, I, ask, I mean, I ask my mom how, sh how her day is every day, and I feel like I sometimes feel like a mom towards my mom. <laughs> oh, I'm I sorry. Can tell. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can tell. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, she, yeah. Do you, can you tell when your mom feels pain? Oh, 100%. <laughs> and, and what are your ways to approach that? Um, a lot of the time it's just me asking her what's wrong or giving her space. Um, and sometimes I'll just... I don't know, sometimes she'll just ask me to stay with her, just be so there with her. We don't have to talk or we like I'm just there for moral support, I think. Um, but yeah. then we do talk a lot of the time as well. And I think just talking about it, that's why therapy is so effective in most cases, because some people just need to talk. That's all yeah, it is. It's true. So let's talk about problematic teens who have pain in their lives and how they can release it. If they don't have a, the luxury of a relationship like yours, how can they go out and talk to someone? You mentioned there's some online, mm -hmm. but that's only for 18 and above. So mm -hmm. how would you suggest for teens to open up to someone? Oh, I think it just goes back to just you do have to find someone. And I, I, I am just such a proponent for therapy in general. But, but all they, now they can get online themselves and Google it. I mean, and we can, we can see minors, as, it doesn't matter how old they are. Yeah. A parent does have to sign off for that, you know. But, um, but I think it's just so important to find someone to talk to and that you can trust if it's a friend's parent or as a church member or, you know, somebody that works at the favorite restaurant you go to that you feel like you could hang out with for a while. Um, right. But do you think for this online, I mean, I think it's great that mm -hmm. they have this online therapy concept, but are there dangers to it? I mean, like anything else yeah, online? Yeah, of course. Um, like I, right now I'm doing online work, as I mentioned earlier. Yes. And um, the problem with it is there's wonderful benefits, but the problem is you never actually see these folks like face to face. So you don't notice those body changes oh, or body language. And so in a lot of my work, I get a lot of information. If someone's just sitting there, I can get a lot of information right. without them saying a word. And so because it's mostly text based and then sometimes telephone, no. you're getting a picture and maybe a safer picture for them because they can tell you what they want. But, um, but for me, it's kind of limiting in that sense. It's great that people who maybe normally wouldn't get help would, yeah. would start, but, right. um, but limiting too. But that just goes back down to why you have such a healthy relationship is that it's the talk, it's the physical being with each other and the energies you share, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think a troubling teen who doesn't necessarily have that at home maybe can find someone, like you said, to just hang out with and let things... It's, it's hard though. I think for boys more too. Way, way hard How do you for boys. Yeah. I think social media has become a good outlet for that. There are pros and cons to social media, but that's, I, I would say that's a good one because you can connect to people mm -hmm. from so many diverse cultures, but at the same time, it's extremely easy for, and, and notorious for predators to come online Yes, as well, exactly. So. It's too open. It's what too, about yeah. schools though? Don't schools have, I mean, no, they have counseling, but how many people really take advantage of that and whether or not that is helpful? My school doesn't have counseling. Really? Which, yeah. Huh. Um, yeah. Okay. Do you think that each school, each yes. high school should have? Oh my gosh, a hundred thousand percent. Yes, we all need counselors okay. in schools. Okay. Um, I think that it's essential. I think that there's just so many opportunities for, for kids to, you know, to have share. Have you ever advocated that it's for a school, for school? I, yes. Maybe they don't, all well, girls' schools have no, not as many problems, that what they think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm not sure, but, um, <laughs> but I, I can vouch that that definitely needs to, to happen. A lot of it is resources. Our student population isn't as high as it could be, and there's oh, just see. not a lot of money circulating. Oh, okay. Well, Ingrid, maybe that's your calling card. Maybe yeah. Maybe you need to go there. I would love to do that. Start I mean, something. I, I, that's a really good idea, actually. Yeah. yeah. Well, I hope you do. So mm -hmm. what are some ways you can both, um, you know, if for some reason somebody's listening to this and they don't want to confront their pain, but you know it's tearing them apart inside, what are some suggestions you both can give to even 
changing or moving forward from that. It's such a hard, especially when you said in the beginning, pain is something if you keep it inside and you hold it, it, it does something to you. It does. It does. It's a horrible feeling. Well, and I, th I think the first indicator is that you're feeling something uncomfortable and you don't quite know what it is. And I think it's right then that you need to, like, just find somebody to just see if you can talk things out with. Because the longer that you wait, then the more layers of things happen and then those experiences pile up. And then before long, you've got a, you know, a history that you haven't dealt with. And then there's just a lot of, you know, trauma associated with it. So, yeah. um, so um I think noticing, you just really have to pay attention to yourself, be self-aware, yeah. and just pay attention to things that go on and, and then be able to reach out. But going back to the numbing idea, because that really does scare me, this whole Xanax thing, I didn't even know that existed until I heard this generation, like mm -hmm. you say, it's so prevalent. Um, you know, that's, do you think that the act of someone even attempting to take something like that definitely means that they have some issues, or is it just their experimental teenage you know, self that just says, I just want to see what it's like. Do you think something's stemming from it? I think, honestly, I think that it's a little, I think it's both. I think that like a natural curiosity, a kid with natural curiosity might want to try it just to see what happens, uh -huh. just out of interest. But then there's the person that might be feeling a lot of stuff that doesn't have, a, don't have a clue what to do with it. And so they're taking something to put it away or make it go away and, and not really have, um, you know, an ability to know yeah. how to manage it. Well, that's the problem, right? Mm -hmm. Most kids don't really know how to manage no, things. No, they don't. I mean, don't. What, what is your threshold? I mean, do you think you know your threshold of pain, both physically and emotionally? Um, I honestly don't know what my <laughs> hormones are capable of. <laughs> Going back to the hormone, but this is a very good point. Mm -hmm. You know, it controls us women at certain <laughs> times, and it's really interesting how that's associated mm. with our actions. Oh, yes. and feelings oh yeah so what do you think I mean as women as young women how do we how do we maintain um, and and filter out unnecessary pain I think a lot of it is as we were talking about earlier is that connection we have of banding together um, yes. as we have historically it, it's really helpful I know sometimes like I just have a group of friends and sometimes we'll just sit around a circle mm -hmm. and complain because that's helpful Right. It feels good, right? Mm -hmm. After yeah. you kind of just... I mean, it's, it's really meager things. That, yeah, and sure. it's just, it's real. There's sometimes it's just really dumb. Like, I, oh, I, I didn't wake up late enough this morning. I don't know. Right, right, yeah. Something just so I actually simple. I envy your, um, er, uh, your era because, you know, you have this group of friends at school that you can just say stupid things to and it feels good mm -hmm. but as adults you know you you lose that you do yeah, that's and so you want so i think that you are so fortunate to have a daughter who is open and and reciprocal and just you know encompassing it's just mm -hmm. really really wonderful to see and i hope uh, audience out there really kind of feel that and to encourage relationships to continue to communicate and if you do have pain to please mm -hmm. please um release it in in constructive ways and like ingrid said and, and as Catherine said you know it's this intrinsic thing that's the word for the day <laughs> yeah, um word. thank you so much for the wonderful conversations and sharing all your experiences thank you all right <laughs> bye